did a talk to the, the WRI in Barry, was one of the, you know, I went off to hear barriers. And the chairman there introduced me as the fabulous Dr. Rendell. And I <laughs> stupidly said this to my chair today, but anyway. So yes, thanks for, for coming for on this lovely day in Hockney. Um, this paper really is going to consider, uh, as you see there, um, changing voices and evolving communities. I'm looking at about 20, uh, 75 years um, the history in Orkney of particularly the, the movement of Ork and migration of Ork coming into Orkney and what's that doing in terms of social and cultural changes. Uh, as you see, um, we'll start off with changes during World War II, which is when, uh, I suppose, uh, people came in in uh, greater numbers or before up to then, we had people, maybe professional people coming in to do their jobs, doctors, ministers, and so on, but nobody many folk coming in to stay on the islands. But um, certainly in the wartime, that changed. The oil developments, um, sorry, the, the new wave of people, you, you hear more about that, then the oil developments um, in the islands in about the 70s. And really, ever since then, there's been a kind of con constant flow for coming in to, to Orkney, um, so I'll speak about that as well. Uh, and really, my main topic is uh, Orkney dialect, and in fact, it's the way we speak. So it link in with the way we speak, hence changing voices, but also uh, the way communities have changed, have developed, have evolved as well over 75 years, and, and the integration with people um, and uh, coming into the islands. Um, uh, and the parishes here in, in Kirkborg. So that is the sort of background to be talk. Really, in, in what time already then, uh, we're talking around about 1939, um, Lesters have got an important uh, place, a very strategic place for, uh, for, for the naval um, uh, service because the Scapa Flow was one well, of the naval bases and Linus was a naval, was a naval base. The Scapa Flow was a shared and harbour area. Not only that, so there were all sorts of camps uh, set up over, uh, through the islands, just in strategic points because Orkney being a sort of gateway um, uh, for shipping and so on, they had to make sure that the place was defended, if you like. So people came up, people were stationed here on the islands. I mean, Home Island of Sandy uh, is one of them, and Ham, of course, which, which was uh, is a parish of Orkney, was another, but they were in, in Florida and different places as well. But with that, they really. Um, what that meant was that um, sort of the population changed, albeit temporary, but people coming in with different voices and also people having the mix with community. Because if they were stationed in Sandy, for example, uh, they had to mix with the people because they were going to be, well, sometimes their families up with them, but they had to eat, and obviously the produce there um, was, was important just for their living. Um, and yes, you got social activity and, and dances as well, and so on. And you got uh, people mixing um, the kind of, and being taken down to the camps to, to, to basically for dancing. You know, Auntie used to speak about being on the back of a, 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 a lorry, being taken, being taken down to, to, to a dance, sitting in a very dangerous position, but it was because we liked dancing, she said. But Arcadians was exposed to new cultures, really, uh, and folk faced those for the first time in either extent, and that's when they realized that at least, I suppose, Woodworth Orkney uh, at, uh, can, at, uh, at, at uh, in meter, in meter, uh, broaden their horizons, if you like. No, I think that's a, quite a lot of writing on that, but basically, I interviewed somebody called David Moss, and he was uh, 15 when the war started, lives in Ham there, and you can see what he says there with the activity there. Some of the men would help out on the farm, he says. Um, I suppose Midwestern is known, but there are so many dialects, different ways of speaking. For example, the Cornish accent, he says, he says was as bad as worse. I mean, I, I hope that nobody here for Cornwall for a start. But you know, for the point there is, uh, accents over all the country are different. You know, different everybody is a different uh, idiolect anyway. So the point I'm making about that is that it was getting familiar with different voices. Um, and he commented as well, uh, it was, I suppose he says it was good times, but thinking about the impression in the water, in fact, it was good to the community. 
the dances I mentioned already, but there was a lot of competition for the lasses as well. <laughs> uh, he mentioned, of course, the introduction of the Italian person as well. This is a, a good point that, um, as we know, the Italians was up here and they built the Italian chapel, as you well know. You might be saw it yesterday, I don't know. But um, we'll have a visit if you don't. But um, when, they, when they Italy surrendered on that, uh, basically they played football with the local people and caught, they made, I think he says somewhere, they had coffee at half time and they made the best coffee as well. So <laughs> it shows that people next, people got on, pe people integrated, even though, I mean, they were not going to be here for very long. Yes, they sell some eggs and milk and so on, so they produce there. Um, but uh, the building of the barriers, of course, was the, 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 the greatest sort of beat, I feel like, because they opened up the South Isles to, uh, by road to, the, to, to, to Kirkwall and the rest of the mainland as well. But after 1945, a lot of these people left. Some of them uh, did uh, meet the uh, Orkney girls and they tend to go through with them. Not very many people settled on the island. So for 1945, 1960, people sort of got back to the sort of mainstay, if you like, the economy, farming, and things didn't change very much at all. And then, in the, in the 1960s, uh, we have for them, Callan, the new wave of people. Now, the new wave of people was really, um, people had decided to have an alternative lifestyle, really. Cottages were being sold because people were, uh, again, were selling the, the PD firms. And everybody came with PD means, PD, everybody came with PD means, and show, nobody, you know, it means small. So the PD crops were being sold, uh, and people uh, bought them, uh, came up with suit and bought them. Um, this meant different accents and different dialects, of course, as well. Uh, different lifestyles, different attitudes. There were some conflicts and conflicts, concerns and conflicts of interest because it was a different way of thinking, a different way of living. Uh, and uh, there'll be some statements later on uh, in the presentation of people that actually, well, was living through that as well as I did. I was, of course, a PD boy in the 60s. Uh, if you believe that, you'll believe anything. But I was. I was at the school in the 1960s in Sandy. So I knew what Laker was first time, but I've spoken to people as well that um, that uh, they sort of uh, really experienced the same as, as I did. But it brought in new ways of new voices and new developments, uh, and more of that in a way later. But then in the 1970s, as you can see up on the board there, Oil, uh, oil happened in, in Orkney. Uh, 1973 was sort of early part when, just before the, the construction of Flood at the terminal there. Um, first Rangers walking about the place basically, so the Pity Island, Florida is not a big population, so that made a difference to the island of sale. And the construction phase began there in 1974. Um, people, as you see there, Local people benefited through food sales and liftware and other services. And the hydro came in 1977, and the Oxygen Royal Company actually paid for rewiring. So there were immediate economic benefit to the island as well as the sale of land to the oil companies. Um, China in 1977, uh, first oil came ashore, quote, it was a good day. And it probably was for Florida, it kept Florida alive, and to this day it keeps it going. And the terminal is just part of life here now, as, as one uh, uh, person said to me. Now, the oil workers, they again joined in the social activities. Life was good, uh, this person said to me, uh, David Sinclair, he uh, There were four social clubs, he says. Uh, folk get the dances, but the flood of life began to disappear. And that's kind of, I mean, supposedly the fact that it's a merchant here. And also it's detrimental that it began to disappear. But, look at the bottom end, oil kept for the gun. This girl here, Sandra, she's grown up with, she's known nothing else but oil in Ireland. So it, it's proof that it, it really did kind of uh, benefit people. But since the 1980s, folk have really steadily come to Orkney. Some have moved in for jobs, some have moved in to retire. But certainly there have been a, a, a draft of people coming in to the islands and uh, to, to Kirkwall and Stromness as well. It's certainly half the population, but it's changed the way of life. And I'll quickly go to this model because I don't want to spend too much time on this, but that's just showing that basically the influences on 
on dialect um, and keeping it on, maintaining it, and you can depends on the location, the attitudes towards it, the people that migrate to the to the place, whether they're mixed into the community, and with that way keeping uh, the dialect actually alive. So that is kind of the, the model that I kind of based on for, for me, PhD thesis. I will now come to some actual um, quotes. I know uh, that I have the fault here, maybe I'm giving you too much, but we, you can have a look at them while I'm, while I'm speaking. <laughs> uh, but basically, this was people uh, for Hoy um, that they interviewed uh, two or three people. And basically, what they're saying there is slow and doing the, the way of speaking. Um, we're really not men that he says to Mark Bushell's understood, uh, so praise if you like, tone and doing the dialect, <laughs> uh, school affected, yeah. Uh, I like this one. I have had to change as I married a Welsh wife, we had to adjust, because uh, she couldn't really maybe have the same knowledge of words as he did. Um, and I mean, uh, that's in my book anyway, which is on sale, 495, open for you. Uh, and his voice is on it as well. Uh, it was a late chat rent, and he, he, he left the North Hawaii, but he was a mine of information. <coughs> but he adjusted, he married somebody for a way. I came up here, um, I think, for a holiday to begin with. Um, I think and within a couple of months, they got the gesture, meaning the dialect. Um, no one moved very swiftly out the North Isles, away out in that direction. Uh, and people from the West, they know this is the first over people, uh, the, the so, well, the incomers, and they call them, I hope people are not embarrassed, I got in trouble once with saying incomers, but that I mean people have moved in to the island, they put with Orkney. Um, I like to think that I'm accepted, uh, but I don't think any incomer can say they are, that's only for the local folk to say. This is one of the people from, um, from, West, from Westy. I think the majority of incomers in Ireland have come with a view of integrating and coming part of the community. That's the key to what I'm speaking about, is integration, is people want them to, to join in with things and not try to fight against what's already in Orkney. This is a, a quite a good quote, it's been on the, on the radio programs as well. Uh, and the, uh, she, this woman, this lady, would like to think that, that we, uh, the Orkney folk, would have the resilience to battle against us incomers and retain the character and not be over influenced by mm -hmm. coming to the island. So she actually realizes that it's maybe a threat to maybe some of the vernacular views. Um, but uh, on the last bullet point, a certain type of person uh, to live on an island, it takes maybe a, a, a certain way of thinking uh, um, and philosophy to actually get used with, with island um, with island life, I guess. Um, and I'll move on from, uh, that's it, just the local folk. Um, uh, it's no longer for they're speaking about PD and a four, before. they can what the words mean and what they use them. They look a bit puzzled in times, but they most of them prefer uh, that you did use the dialect. People don't, the people that moves in don't really want us to change. They feel that it, it is one way of speaking. And if you think about it, if you go to, in Scotland, and if you go to Aberdeen, uh, or Glasgow, or whatever, they maintain their way of speaking. Uh, anybody here from Aberdeen? No? You know the Aberdonian accent, or it's a Doric, and that's a specific tongue, uh, and they don't really change, they're very really proud of it, and same here with Westy folk, they're very proud of that. Sandy is my home island. Um, we were taught to speak English at the school here, uh, this person says there. Um, never resent, any resentment. No need to adapt to change the way of speaking. Now this is, um, yeah, uh, this is basically people that moved in 20 years ago. Uh, they were used in commerce. Uh, I maybe occasionally use some that in words, she said, uh, but I, uh, if I'm put on the spot, I, I don't know what, I think that's because our friends would speak it. But um, you feel a part of the community. This is a young girl aged when I interviewed at 18. Um, uh, and folk make you feel welcome, Orkney is definitely my home. And that's good at the younger generation thinking about this uh, and really mixing in. And they, they didn't think there any resentment. Now, I'll try to get through this one because I realize it's five minutes yet. Um, and I'll, uh, I'll look at, you know, people uh, bacon loaves that are like bricks and German and tangles. I'm not sure the truth that is, that's what the interview he said. Uh, but, we had to change a bit, but the clear, the clear 
important, but here is in general study for accepted income of F no uh, if it no being the change, population study would have been deep. It kept Sandy going, it kept the island going. But he says, of course, because you're done it, uh, it's partly your identity for understand you <coughs> by that. Um, because I only have five minutes, I, I'm going to kind of very quickly mention this family, but I'm not going to go on because it's basically the same. But, um, somebody knew the author, you, you change it, you, you dilute your accent. Um, if you're dealing with people of the South, I never thought of speaking differently to anybody at all. This West Mainland person really, um, this is somebody who moved in and a lot of folk modified their speaking so people understand. But some of them, my daughter was exposed to the dialect, it's like sort of being exposed to some direct sunlight, you're exposed. But this person uh, says that her do uh, his daughter was exposed to the dialect and could, she could hear, he could hear it among when she was speaking to her friends and she had to just English, but was her, what was that, what was the Arcadian voice of what was now. Uh, and very occasionally I would catch myself doing it. Uh, but every now and then I would use it out of other sentence structure, like of course the famous, uh, the famous PE. Um, on towards the sort of end, but let me talk no, but um, this is the kind of, in a way, summing up, if you like. But um, I'm tying this in with some theory uh, theoretical uh, work by Marshall about communities, about sharing values with the links between language and geography, but attitudes, as Trudkel says there, and making sure that people have to be think about what they're sharing, and uh, uh, Ralph Fasold as well, whether a person thinks of or shares a member of the same community, whether another person is, is taught us as a visitor, or vice versa, the presence and absence of conflict between the communities all work together to determine the degree of speech accommodation. So really, um, integration, folk have, uh, <laughs> that's a, um, oops, I take that too far. That is, uh, uh, that's, that's the way we say it in ordinary folk, yeah. Folk have engaged each other uh, and, and participated in activities, as we see. As people have quoted, it's essential to play some part of the community if people move to ordinary, and the people that moved in they know that as well. Uh, but some people might not be suited to the islands at all. Um, so we are getting a picture of people feeling that they need to integrate, feeling they must accept some of the changes, accept some of our, 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 our funny ways, our peculiar ways as well. There is a summary, I, as I say, because of the time factor, I'm not going to, that it basically sums up what I've been speaking about for the last 20 minutes. Um, conclusions then, come on right up here. Conclusions and we can, some of the thoughts that I have uh, in, in order to sum up. Basically, change in voices have encouraged folk, indigenous folk, to target their interest in the heritage. So, because of people who move in, we realize that what, what dialect is important and we are to promote it better. And I think that's good. It's good that people don't need to think about the way they speak and not just you know, accept that it's just something we do. Island populations have been stable, so that it's, it, it's the communities have survived and are still viable. Some will change, some will, will change the demographic in the islands, but nevertheless, the islands will survive. And I think the incomers have been British the way on the islands, as I'm saying there. I think they've realized that this is island life. This is not a, a city center somewhere uh, in the south of England. Um, but the island and language folk changes with time. You speak different tongues, different, maybe different languages, you, all your dialects and language um, uh, options will change as you go through life, basically. And it's in, 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 inevitable, that coffee was strong, inevitable, <laughs> but folk has to rise to challenges. But the main point with all this is that positive attitudes and shared values are the key driving factors. And I think um, can my sort of overall um, hypothesis really is that if people are in, in, have a, have a have a positive attitude towards one another, then we, our dialect will survive. Um, lastly, um, Caroline McAfee has said that uh, basically, and uh, look at the bottom bit here, for well, this part right up, um, rural communities with sufficient economic resources to prevent masses out of <coughs> migration, people moving out of all, you know, this, um, 
uh, younger generation and sufficient self-assurance to have sought a nativized income. And I'm not sure who I can a nativize. Maybe my next project is to try and nativize people. But I think it means getting them in the picture of what it means to be Arcadian, what the Alpi dialect means to us, the dialect speakers as well. And she says that Orkney and Shetland are the places that best fulfill those criteria. So I'm kind of zoomed over it, but what, there's a summary. Uh, we are uh, very happy to see people moving into the islands, but we like to keep our identity, keep our heritage. The island is part of our heritage. Some of you probably saw some of the, our stone built heritage yesterday, but the island, Orkney dialect, is part of our heritage, our spoken heritage, as the stones are for the Neolithic. I'm going to end with a funny sunset photo I took. You won't get one like this today, <laughs> but I don't know if you can see from the back. But this is written by Robert Rendell, and it sums up, I think, what I've been trying to say for the last 20 minutes. And he said, Wild oracles with measured ebb and flow beat day and night upon this lonely beach. And I again can hear with sudden thrill Tides that return from timeless years ago with syllables of unremembered speech that in the mind's deep silence echo still. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, John, for a very interesting talk and uh, um, very timely considering that the Orkney Dictionary has just gone online in the last couple of weeks. I might like to invite anybody who has questions for John. Um, this is uh, about a little part of what you spoke about, not the big part of what you spoke about. You mentioned the barriers and how that sort of changed life in the South Islands. Yes. Um, is there anything in that change that made them particularly East Mainland as opposed to... Uh, <laughs> because the barriers bring you into the East and then they sort of still you in a curveball. Is, is there anything particularly Easty about that that made the Southiness Eastiness? <laughs> That's a, a good cultural question, as I can expect to be for your perspective, but I, I see where you're going. And to answer that, the people, especially I live in South Toronto, say, uh, maybe not so much body, but the people live in South Toronto still think of themselves sometimes as islanders uh -huh. rather than part of East Mainland or whatever. But uh, I think what I'm seeing any, uh, anyway is, that, that and we know with this east-west divide, we know west men and say anything over there, and anything over that direction is east. In fact, east men are really, in a way, is dareness and tackiness. Uh, the South Isles is known as a connected South Isles. The one for the North Isles, and that is a clear identity. And I, I'm not in specific uh, you know, questions on the South Isles and who they speak in attitudes and towards identity, but just to hear them speaking to locally, even last night, I think somebody's answered about the South Isles are still islands, so you can drive across and come into Catapult. So, to answer your question, they're certainly never west. They will never be west, whatever happens. <laughs> you know, and there's nothing wrong with west. I know some people come to Strongness here, so I'd better be awfully careful. <laughs> but I'm safe, because I'm from the North Isles, so I'm the yes. so, But anyway, I think hey, Jack is first in the Perhaps wartime meant there wasn't time for this, but did they welcome the barriers? Oh, oh. And, and I mean, were they immediately available to connect them to Kirkwall or for military reasons? Could they not cross right. them anyway? I would say, on the whole, they were welcome with open <coughs> arms, and I'll tell you why I'm saying that. I interviewed a John McKenzie, who lead John McKenzie as well, and he spoke to me about, and I asked him, what lake was it for the barriers? And he says, we were heading a board for such and special throne to into Ham, well, into, into Ham, and then you can get the bus in the town. And it took us about 10 hours, he said. To get, can, the, the, whole day, the whole day, the whole day, was a 10 hour day. No, he says, we can just get in a car or a bus and, and get the town. So yes, he was in his 70s, late 70s when I interviewed. So yes, they did embrace it. And, I, and as far as I know, um, when the barriers was built and ready for opening, they were they were open to, to everybody. Yeah, but yes, most people would say that they were a, a huge benefit purely for the reasons I've just given that you know they didn't have that sea travel. And if you're doing it in the far end of the Sea, uh, you had to drive all the way to I suppose the Hop Pier and get something for the Hop Pier into Ham Pier. So you know 
he had all that distance to, 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 to go, so it was certainly uh, a benefit, and yes, it was available. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. It, it was really just a, more or less a question, but I'm sure that mm -hmm. I think it was Billy Scott who told me once that um, the, the dialect of the South End of South France is somewhat influenced by Caithness. Right. Good question. And um, the day, obviously, I mean, folks on something different, not the linguistic pattern, but I can tell you that some of the pronunciation, especially the I N G word endings uh, uh, over in South France, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, they go. They, I would go fishing, and the way they hear the way they say that fishing, they would go fishing. They change it, the mm -hmm. and so that's just one uh, small bit of, of you can, linguistic principle there. They do have a different tone, some of their voice, even they almost hear whether there's any, and I know, I think Michael maybe mentioned this in his thesis as well, but the, the Gallic influence, I think we spoke with that, we're spoken about it personally anyway, but they might have been more of the, of the Scottish, Hectish. Even way of, or Celtic way of speaking, it's still maybe uh, practiced by folk the South Isles. Certainly, when I listen to the South Isles speakers, uh, you can hear it differently. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm fit over that mm -hmm. part of the world, the North Isles, and we do have different tones. It's not only intonations, but yes, you're right, I think there are quite a connection with Scotland, but they're only six miles. <laughs> <laughs> they, yes. they, 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 I think there was, there was quite a lot of horse, horse trading, oh, yeah. so to speak, uh, went on between the. Between the so Commerce, whether there was, yeah. was a, 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 a land bridge between them or not. But if you think about it, others that I mean, there were six miles between South Toronto and Sea and uh, and Caithness. Uh, How many miles was it before you got to Caithness? Yeah, it was right. near and three quarters to Caithness to go for anything. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I was really interested in your use of indigenous uh, to describe Locadians and. In the North American context of indigeneity and post-colonial studies, it's very controversial to use that in a European context. Okay. And a fish, which I, I, I find that controversy problematic in itself. And I, I think in, in Europe, within Europe officially, the only indigenous population is the Sami, or the Sami. Ah, so I'm just wondering what you, what you think of that and how you, okay. how you situate that right. yeah. within a post I think I, uh, the, uh, the context in which I use it and we tend to use it in okay, what I've been doing, sorry, uh, indigenous just simply means uh, belonging to rather than the roots, because what roots in you know, they probably go back much further than the Vikings, or way back, they're probably European, so we are probably in the European, uh, way back as far as uh, real indigenous people would have been. But what we use here is more than sort of broad term for but just simply being a native of, meaning a person who has lived in Orkney for several generations. So that's what how I use uh, indigenous uh, rather. I like the way I thought uh, McAfee says native eyes. Now, I don't like to be called a native of Orkney mm -hmm. because, I mean, I just don't, I, the terminology is wrong for me as used to be indigenous. I don't like to be called a native of Orkney. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm an Orcadian, mm -hmm. not a native. <laughs> <laughs> A good question because uh, some of the people I interviewed, I mean, didn't have time to cover yeah. everybody, but some of the people I interviewed just said exactly uh, uh, yeah. what you said that. That uh, I felt I, I did, couldn't use it because I would be being insulting to the local folk. Mm -hmm. However, for me as a dialect, so called expert, but a dialect man, if you like, um, I am very happy to people to, 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 uh, to engage in dialect if they wish. However, I think that maybe if you don't know how to say PD, it's better not to say it, <laughs> or, to, or to say it like P day, which is cringe, <laughs> makes me think. Alice is laughing. But um, it's what I'm point is, I've even practiced the word. I mean, I, I, I do evening classes, so I'm maybe thinking about doing that, not for insulting people, but 
because it, it's it's a whole subject in itself. But I I personally, but a lot of people, uh, uh, people has moved in uh, to use it. Just on that side, I know nearly all the time, no, but I, I did an evening class last winter, and I had one of one of my students was uh, somebody who moved in from Scotland this time with two boys and a husband, and the boys were maybe ten and twelve or something like that, and at fifth school. Okay, now they're only been here for a for a pretty while, if you like. But they are beginning are ready to embrace the dialect, and it's coming out in the, the, the tone of voice. And when they speak, their friends on the phone is speaking dialect. That, to me, is positive, and it's good for us. I mean, if that's going to happen, I, I'm I'm actually thinking that the dialect will not will not uh, de deteriorate much further. It might even get stabilised. Might be a new type of dialect, as I mentioned. It will evolve, evolving communities, as I said. But I'm hopeful that uh, that kind of uh, progress will uh, help it to stay as the way we speak. Thank you, Tom. I'm afraid we've no more time for questions now, but thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.